nearly 10 years since Ben Drury co-founded Seven Digital, the digital marketplace. He's with us today to tell us how they survived and why the UK's big tech companies need more attention. Welcome to Tech Sessions. I'm with Ben Drury today. Welcome, Ben, Chief Executive and co-founder of Seven Digital. Um, is a startup still a startup if it's been going for nearly 10 years as Seven Digital has? Absolutely. I think the, the phrase startup is not necessarily related to how how old the company is, but more related to a, a philosophy and an ethos. You want to be part of the cool club? Uh, <laughs> not necessarily. I think that the, if you're if you're still in a phase of your company where you where you want to try and disrupt other um, other uh, other markets and you and you're still going for growth, you're not establishing a business and focusing just on the bottom line. Then um, I think you can still qualify. Okay, fair enough. We'll we'll let you have that one. Now, Seven Digital started primarily as a, um, a music offering for consumers. Um, so was that streaming or downloading? Tell people who might not have found your service so far. But given that we've been here for 10 years, actually we started off as B2B. We, um, our, first, our first clients in, back in 2004 were the record labels. So we helped the record labels release digital singles. I think our first one was Muse Stockholm Syndrome with Warner, and then we did Coldplay with EMI, and then we did um, Island Records for uh, an Island Tunes for Island Records. So um, we were B two B. We were helping the, the record labels release singles. This is before iTunes had launched, but it was back in the bad old days of DRM and Windows Media and. Ugh. So this is very very early on helping record labels to digitise their offerings and make them available to the public, and trying to imagine the music world pre iTunes. Is quite strange. Yeah, it was. Um, we weren't. We weren't digitising their catalogues. They would already begun to do that, but we were helping them actually get 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 stuff out there. Um, at the time, piracy was really massively increasing, so they needed to do something, and we found that was a, was a great niche for us to go in. And we really, really, really grew from there. And then, when iTunes launched, you became more of a consumer proposition. Well, over uh, over time, we we realised that we were building a, a really great technology platform and a great catalogue with lots of licensing. We were still running loads of um, stores for other people. We'd expanded from doing uh, single tracks to artist stores and then to label stores and then to do st start to do other brands. We realised that um, we were getting consumers coming to us saying, oh, we want access to all of your catalogue, not just Faithless or whatever. So we decided to, to put together a, a consumer offering, but that was never really our focus. That was just because people, um, people were demanding it. Yeah, and then more recently, you've gone much deeper into the B two B space again. So you've been working with handset manufacturers. Yeah, so I mean, to cut a long story short, we managed to expand the, the technology platform and expand our rights geographically. We managed to get licensed in the US, which is almost impossible. We managed to get licensed in Canada and the whole of Europe and Australia and New Zealand, um, and we, we found increasingly that we were we were solving a a problem that um, others needed solving, like people like Samsung, who are a big client of ours, and BlackBerry. So they wanted access to our technology and the rights that we had in, to enable them to offer uh, services to consumers. And um, the big shift, I think, two or three years ago, is we, um, we decided that we shouldn't just do downloads. I mean, we were really in the iTunes world for, for a long time. But today, we're now offering um, a huge amount of streaming services. Um, on-demand streaming services and also radio. Uh, in the last year, radio has become a significant part of our business. And how have you differentiated what you do from iTunes, but also from Amazon, from Google, even from Last FM, and now obviously Spotify? Well, I guess from a from a business perspective, we we are more B two B, so we have a what we call an open agnostic platform. It's completely. Um, it's completely open in the sense that anyone can sign up for an API key, even if you're a bedroom developer. You can get going, it will give you access to the world's music, you can start building your application. Then if you want to commercialize it, you come and talk to us about a commercial license, we'll get the approvals that you need from the labels and off you go. That's a unique offering, no one else is doing that. That's not something that Spotify would do, that's not something that iTunes would be interested in doing. So we're, we're more in that um, platform as a service or B2B type style thing. So that's a big differentiator. And the fact now that we can offer um, really high quality downloads on one side, we can offer radio streaming, people like turntable.fm use our platform in the US. And then we can offer on-demand streaming for people like Samsung and beat.no in Norway and loads of other companies. So it's that flexibility and that, um, 
agnosticism. We use the cliche of we're the, we're the Switzerland of the digital music world. The word pivoted is a bit overused, I know, but um, over the course of 10 years you have had to be very adaptable and flexible in, in your business and it, its focus. Certainly, I guess that may even be one of the criteria they use to define a startup, that a company that's able to be nimble and adapt to the circumstances around them, being fleet of foot. Um, I would argue that we haven't pivoted per se, which seems to be more around completely changing everything and going down a completely different route. But we've had to adapt ourselves along the road as things like streaming have emerged, as DRM faded away, as opportunities have arisen in different markets. We we're not a technology company that a lot of technology companies don't have real, really dependencies on others they can just carry on and build their own platform but we obviously have de massive dependencies on record labels and publishers and that whole world so we we have to um, adapt as they adapt so tell us about the the opportunities in other markets then because are you reliant on where the record labels want to really push developing markets and growth audiences or do you have ambitions in other bits of the world, regardless of what the, the record labels want to do? Well, the, um, th there obviously is something that has to happen hand in hand. If we want to go to China or something and the record labels don't want to license, then obviously it's difficult. But um, the opportunities in, in some of the emerging markets is absolutely enormous. In some of the markets, there are huge populations all, going, all getting smartphones, and traditionally they've never really spent any money on music. Um, so Mexico, for example, um, where music is hugely popular and um, there's loads of activity online, but a lot of it is illegal um, and piracy. I've always, I've always argued this comes down to fundamentals, that people value music as important to them in their lives. And if it's not, then it's going to be very difficult to make a business work anyway. But if it, if it is, then often it's a supply and demand challenge um, and a pricing challenge. So. Does it make sense to charge 99 cents or the equivalent a track in some markets? Absolutely not. So you have to look again at the, the relative pricing and the value of what you're offering. And there's been success in some emerging markets where they have more like track packs. You pay the equivalent of a dollar, but you get 500 tracks, so you get 200 tracks. So the price per song is very low, but it's still consumer spending money on music. And in a market where, like China, where I think it's 1.3, 1.4 billion people, then you don't need to too many of them to be spending too much money to create a, a very significant opportunity. So talking of money, um, over you've been going for nearly 10 years, so um, we would expect you to be making money and to be really profitable by now. We were, we were profitable in 2011, but we raised some uh, finance in, we raised $10 million in 2012, so we're deploying that capital right now. We are turning over tens of millions of dollars, so we're a substantial sized business. Um, Nothing like a, an apple or something, but pretty good for a but UK. But you're British. Pretty UK company. Mm. Uh, we've got 120 staff. We have offices in San Francisco, LA, Luxembourg, New Zealand, Berlin, and but most of our people are in, in are in London. So, so we're doing all right. IPO anytime right. soon. IPO. Well, unfortunately, the um, the markets for IPO, certainly in the UK, seem to be pretty pretty closed still. Um, I speak a lot. <laughs> I was, I was laughing about this the other day. It's an often it's an entrepreneur's dream to take your company public. You know, you prefer to do that than sell out. But I now speak to a lot of um, AIM-listed CEOs who have, have, have achieved that dream, but now they, they're desperate to go private. It, it's a nightmare for them. There's no liquidity on the market. Um, the reporting requirements and the, um, the administration, you have to hire a lot of expensive PR firms and expensive advisors and lawyers and everything. It costs hundreds of thousands of pounds a year just to maintain a listing. And um, yeah, I speak to a lot of um, CEOs who are desperate to go private. I just think that's very ironic. Ben, thanks very much for joining us on Tech Sessions and good luck. Thank you.